Hello and welcome to another episode of the Backyard Space Show brought to you by the Backyard Space Program. I'm your host Kyle and tonight we thank you for joining us. Um, we apologize for the little delay we had and we're playing on Monday because we had some audio problems on the last recordings we did so basically had to record everything after our news section so we were able to save those videos. Um, a reminder, we do have another giveaway for a telescope this month, so head to the Facebook page and like, share, and comment on the post, and that'll get you into the uh, drawing. And lastly, hopefully at the beginning of the next year, um, we're going to try to get the website going where we're going to try to move a lot of functions over to that uh, without giving too much away. You know, it's probably going to be pretty cool, so just stay tuned and, you know, release more information about it as we go along. As I said before, here's those news clips. Check them out. So, after spending a budget of a measly $8.7 billion, the James Webb Space Telescope has spread its golden wings for the first time. It is said to be launched into space October of 2018 and will be placed over a million miles from Earth. It is named after James Webb, the man who led the NASA Space Agency during the 1960s and oversaw the launch of the Hubble Space Telescope which uh, the JWST is uh, actually scheduled to re replace that. With a 20-foot, 18-hexagonal mirror optic system, the JWST is expected to gather light seven times more than the Hubble. It was created in the hopes that it can further uncover the truth about how stars, planets, and other celestial objects formed 13 billion years ago in the aftermath of the Big Bang. In reality, the JWST was a space telescope that almost wasn't. Originally conceived in 1966 and with an expected budget of 500 million, it was labeled the telescope that ate astronomy by Nature magazine and was almost canceled in, uh, canceled out during a House subcommittee meeting, but it instead was allowed to proceed with a strict budget cap. And it's uh, pretty interesting, um, this telescope here uh, on screen. I don't know if you can see my pointer, but see, they're going to have, uh, this comes down right there. Light bounces off and that hits this mirror and goes into the middle here, I believe. It's going to be pretty cool. It's going to be a million miles from Earth, so that's supposed to look at exoplanets, I believe, as well. So, you can read more about that over at the uh, New York Times website in the Science News category. So, moving on. As some of you may have already noticed, Venus is rising higher and higher in the evening sky as the northern hemisphere moves into the winter seasons. Also known as the evening star, its elongation to its furthest point in its orbit around the sun peaks during the middle of winter up until March of 2017. During this elongation, it will be the brightest object in the sky following the sun and the moon and will be easily visible even through a small telescope. Venus is also known as our sister planet with a radius of only 5% smaller than, than our planet. And in its past, it's speculated it may have had an atmosphere similar to ours, but over time, a runaway greenhouse effect essentially destroyed the planet's atmosphere and made it completely in, inhospitable for any type of organic life. Um, it's, it's a pretty uh, interesting object to image if you can get to it. Uh, it has phases just like the moon uh, with Mercury and Venus both have phases because of the inner planets so more of uh, that story can be read over at space.com so let's go all right December 7th an article was posted detailing how an ancient astronomer's tablet suggested the Earth's spin was slowing however not quite as much as scientists had previously thought it was found that during each century, the length of a solar day, or the time it takes the Earth to make a full rotation, grows by 1.8 milliseconds according to a new study using astronomical observations from around 750 BC. These observations came from clay cuneiform tablets written by the ancient Babylonians who were known for keeping detailed records. These records included keeping track of solar and lunar eclipses, but modern scientists also look to ancient Greek and Chinese writings as well as to come to these uh, as well to come to these findings. 
As stated in the original article, these findings have been considered dry if not for the staggering fact that these measurements would be impossible had it not been for our ancient fellow humans writing down their original observations. More of this story can be found at LiveScience.com. Alright, so moving on. Alright, so now you have a telescope. You may have noticed you also need an eyepiece to view through if you plan on doing visual astronomy. And there are just as many choices with eyepieces as there are telescopes and mounts. Usually when purchasing a telescope bundle, they will include a couple of eyepieces, but they're in limited sizes. In this scenario, the best thing to look for is an eyepiece kit available from almost every telescope manufacturer and distributor. Uh, one great set that's good to start off with, it's about 150 bucks, is the Celestron Basic Eyepiece Set, which includes five eyepieces, Barlow lens, filters, and case. Um, Phil from the UK, uh, one of our BSB members, he sent us a video. Uh, so let's check that out real quick. So this is the Celestron Eyepiece and Filter Kit. And in here we can see there are five eyepieces. We have a 32mm, 17mm, 6mm, 8mm, 13mm. This is a Barlow lens times two. And here we have the filters. This is a 0.9 reduction, um, very good for looking at the moon through. We have green filter, yellow filter, orange, light green, red and blue. All right, so that was the uh, Celestron RP set. That might be fine and dandy, but there are some better lenses, uh, eyepiece lenses that you can get that do cost more, like from companies like Bader. Uh, Phil's got another video for us here that's going to show some of those, so let's check that one. And here is a collection of some very nice eyepieces, uh, all from Bader. Uh, we have the 6.5 Morpheus, giving a 76 wide view have a hyperons 5 mil 17 mil and 24 millimeter and as you can see the viewing lens there is is quite large and so you can have a very large wide field view of the sky when using these uh, they also give quite some um, good eye relief, so you don't have to place your eye right up against the lens. You can um, keep your eye about 20 millimeters away and you can get a, a perfect image through these. All right, so. I want to show you some of the eyepieces that we have here in the studio. Um, starting off with one of the old standbys, the Plossel eyepiece. Uh, this is made by Ryan here. This is a serious Plossel 25mm. You're going to get a pretty wide field view. A nice big eye relief there. And uh, that's for looking at large areas of the sky. We got another, this is a um, Celestron 23 millimeter, 62 degree aspheric. This is a really nice one to look through. Has a nice wide field as well. 
Um, if you want to move on down the line here, we got another Orion Sirius Flossil. This is a 10 millimeter. This has a much smaller eye area to look through, but uh, magnified much more. And we got two four millimeters here. Another. This is a Datsun Plossil four millimeter. Very small diameter hole to look through. That's great for looking at planets. Um, this one here is another Celestron. Has a bit better eye relief. It's a 62 degree of sphere, four millimeter. And personally, I like that one for looking at planets through. Um, Obviously, this is a Barlow lens. This magnifies. Uh, you can put your eyepiece in through the top, stick this in the telescope. And this was a three times magnification, which obviously it gives you more, you know, uh, gives you a little bit more magnification added to whatever your eyepiece is. And then lastly, we got a Celestron uh, zoom, 8mm to 24mm. This one's actually pretty nice. You can, you know, go from a higher magnification like 8mm back to a wide field of view, 24mm. Um, really nice open area. This is real soft. And I believe you can actually take this off here and add a camera right to the end. That's, uh, you know, you can have a good, pretty good setup with that. So, speaking of cameras, we're going to move on to those next. Alright, so now that you've got your eyepieces and you've been outside viewing the sky above, now what? Maybe you want to take some pretty pictures of what you're seeing. Well, as with everything in this hobby, there are many, many choices to be had, almost staggering. So, one simple solution to this is, and you probably, I, you know, you might have one laying around at home. <laughs> Just kidding, I know everybody has one, it's a smartphone. You can actually take your smartphone. They make many different adapters for these right here. And believe it or not, you can get some really good pictures uh, with different apps that you can get on there. And even certain cameras with a higher megapixel, they can, you know, with the stock camera app, you can get some good pictures. But uh, I'll, I'll mention later, once we get to the uh, software, about those apps that you can get on your phone. Um, another great item. And, you know, not as many of you might have it at home, but you, you might as a DSLR camera with a removable lens. In fact, the, the, what we're shooting on right now is a Canon T6i, which I'd show you, but we are shooting through it. But right here is an older version. And, you know, you, this is a XTI. Okay, it's, um, you know, it's still a good camera. You can get these pretty cheap, but... Like one I have is a, a Canon T5. Uh, I got a picture of it right here, I believe. Yep, there we go. So that's a Canon T5. You can get the body for about 250 bucks, and the kit lens. You know they they do have kit lenses, pretty cheap as well. So it's a really good starter camera. It, and you know if you want to spend a little bit more, you can get the T6i. That, I believe the T5 is 18 megapixel, T6i is 24.2, plus it has Wi-Fi and uh, NFC, which means you can connect your phone to it, which uh, gives you a lot of options, especially if you're doing this kind of stuff, so, um, you know, you can check that out. One thing, uh, let's see, Phil, he sent some pictures, the uh, cameras that he uses are Nikon. Uh, me, personally, I use Canon, but that's just me. But Phil, he uses a Nikon, so let's see here. We got a uh, video of him in his D80. Yep, right here. Let's see. There you go. So that's the uh, D80 right there. It does It's got a screen on top. Um, you can get those on eBay. Uh, fairly cheap. I believe, yeah, there's a T adapter right there for the Nikon. Um, and they're specific to it. I was trying to look around and see if I could find one, but they are specific. They have Canon EOS adapters, uh, and this adapter here will allow you to um, connect an eyepiece, like the one I showed you just a minute ago. This right here, you take it off right there, and you can screw that into a T adapter. So that's that's pretty cool. 
um, some other cameras that he mentioned was the Canon D700. Okay, that's that's one of them there. And then the Canon, I mean not Canon, but Nikon. Excuse me, Nikon D700. And the D750, which is the newest release, I believe. So those are a few of the DSLR cameras that uh, we said, you know, you can check out. You know, especially do the research yourself. They, there's a website called imagingresource.com, which they have comparisons on different cameras. So, you know, it's a really good place to do your research at. Check it out and see the different, you know, see what you want based upon what you really want to do. Um, one more thing I want to mention about cameras. Um, we're not going to delve into it a whole lot tonight. But they're really cheap. They're great if you're doing astronomy to get started with. And these are really cheap CCD cameras. Okay, this is a uh, Mi DSi 2 Pro. The last one they came out with was a DSi 3. They did discontinue this series. But it does come with a filter set. Which you can't see here, but you got luminance, which is clear looking when you look through it, but that adds detail to your picture. Um, green, blue, and red. So, this is a mono camera here, and it's not tech cool. It uses a uh, dissipation through the metal here, but you can get these on like uh, eBay, uh, Cloudy Nights, Astro Mart pretty cheap I got this one for like 175 bucks so you know this, these are good cameras to start off with you do have to have software to run them this is a Orion G3 they, these cameras use the identical um, sensors so they, they take pretty much the same picture except the Orion G3 is a little more expensive and it's tech cool it has a fan here in the back that helps cool off the sensor but um, you can check those out, do a little bit of reading. We're going to come up with an episode uh, about advanced astrophotography and more expensive, obviously, cameras, but more options that you have later down the road. So let's move on to the uh, software. All right, so now that we've got past the eyepieces, cameras, software. Okay, so there's a lot of stars up there to look at and it can be pretty hard figuring out all the names to them or especially if you got your mount and you're doing your polar alignment three star alignment afterwards you pick a star to start off with and some of them you might know like Vega or Deneb or even Polaris so that's the star you're trying to line up to but if it shows stars you don't know the name to it's really nice to have an, a, an app and especially um, mobile apps too uh, one good app on the computer that I wanted to mention first is Stellarium. It's free. It's an open source uh, astronomy app <clears throat> that you can... It's bewildering how much stuff you can get for that app. I mean, you'll never be able to look through all the stars that they allow you to see in that, um, that application. But um, you can download extensions if you want to. Um, but moving on to mobile apps, one good free app. Uh, is Skyview. Uh, that one's pretty much completely free. If you want to get add-ons, they do have in-app in purchases. Another one is Star Chart, which I have running on my phone here. Um, it'll show you what's in the sky for your area. Okay. They do have in-app purchases. Like I think it comes with a hundred thousand objects. Um, but you can get like an expansion for up to two and a half million. Um, then uh, you can get like satellites added on where you can it'll tell you a bunch of satellites that are in your area where to spot them like the ISS. Uh, then you have apps like Sky Safari which I've heard is really good. They just came out with Sky Safari 5. They got three different levels. It's um, standard 299 astronomy level is uh, 14.99 and the professional level is like 30 bucks but you know for me I think the astronomy level would probably be the best you can actually run your telescope with that um, and not to mention the Stellarium app for the computer you can run up to nine different go-to telescope mounts 
so I just wanted to mention that as well um, but yeah the, the apps that you use typically for those cameras I was showing you earlier uh, just in case anyone's, uh, anyone was of an interest uh, if you buy this new it usually comes with the Orion uh, <coughs> camera studio and the me DSI usually comes with that but if, if you buy one use like I did the program that Mead still uh, lets you download for free is called Invisage. So you can go to their website for that. But uh, oh, another app on the mobile phone that will help you uh, unlock the camera on your phone. Because like I was telling you earlier, you can take pictures with this. Um, but typically the stock camera apps for mobile phones don't allow you to change things like ISO, white balance, shutter speed, uh, exposure time. Uh, so one good app is Nightcap Pro. I think that's $2.99, but that one's built up from the ground specifically for astrophotography. Um, and then one app that I really like is the uh, ProShot. Um, I got the camera cover on my phone closed, but this allow this is set up just like a DSLR. You know, you can change everything I just mentioned. It gives you pretty much complete access to the camera controls on the, the phone, which will help you in uh, getting the settings just right to pick up stars. Because the on app autofocus and you know the stock camera app that comes with that, it just doesn't. It's not made to, to focus in on stars and put the balance right with something that far away and that small. So um, yeah, that's about it for the software. So. Alright, so we hope this information will help you make some informed decisions on eyepieces, cameras, and software uh, after you've chosen your telescope and mount. Uh, in later episodes, we'll cover things, uh, more advanced topics like I was talking about, CCD imaging, uh, CMOS imaging, those kind of cameras, and the uh, software needed to run them. Uh, we'll also be creating these videos once every two weeks, so once every two, uh, we'll do a Sunday, and then two weeks later we'll do another Sunday, so... You know, it's just kind of hard to pack in, in you know, everything we got to put into one of these in one week because we all try to work together. And this is like a worldwide effort, uh, if you get what I'm saying. So, uh, you know, we got working, we got work jobs, got family. So that's that, that kind of thing. Um, we look forward to making more of these videos. Uh, and if you have any suggestions for future videos, topics, things you want to hear us uh, look up, research, and talk about. Just let us know, drop us a comment down below in the uh, YouTube video comments or on our Facebook. And that's about it. Thank you for watching tonight's show and uh, hope to see you next time. I'm your host Kyle and good night. <laughs>